Chapter 1 of ICD-10-CM is for certain infectious and parasitic diseases. This chapter covers transmissible infections and parasitic diseases classified according to cause or etiology. This presentation will cover the official ICD-10 guidelines specific to this chapter. There will also be clinical scenarios to practice coding what you just learned, followed by a small quiz at the end of the presentation. For each coding example, you will need to pause the webinar and use your ICD-10-CM coding manual to code the scenario. Once you resume the webinar, we will go over the correct codes, the rationale behind them, as well as how to locate them in the ICD-10 manual. Keep in mind that there may be more than one way to find a code. We are aware that there is a great deal of information contained in this presentation. Therefore, at any time during the webinar, please feel free to pause and replay as needed. It is important that you have already completed the introduction to ICD-10-CM webinar, as you will use the conventions and general guidelines discussed in the introduction to complete the coding scenarios. As you can see on this slide and your ICD-10-CM manual, the codes for this chapter start with the letters A and B. If you remember from ICD-9, these codes all started with numbers 0 and 1. The list of sections in ICD-10 is extremely similar to ICD-9 and even follows the same order in the codebook as ICD-9. Many of the diseases in this chapter are coded by using combination or multiple codes. When I say multiple codes, I am referring to assigning more than one code to provide information about a manifestation and the associated underlying condition. One of the important features of ICD-10 is that it will better help the U.S. track public health concerns. It is important to know when organisms are resistant to antibiotics. Therefore, if the documentation indicates that the organism infecting a patient is resistant to antibiotics, that you code not only the infection, but also a code from category Z16, which indicates infection with drug-resistant microorganisms. If you turn to category Z16 in your ICD-10 book, which for the Optum 2015 ICD-10-CM Expert for Physicians is page 1062, you'll see that the specific type of antibiotic is identified in the codes and therefore should be documented by the provider. This slide contains all the HIV-related codes. B20 is for symptomatic HIV-positive patients. Once the patient has had an opportunistic infection, meaning an infection that only affects someone with a compromised immune system, they are assigned code B20 thereafter. Code Z21 is used for reporting a patient diagnosed with HIV-positive status, but that patient has never had an opportunistic infection. The draft guidelines state, a patient should never be assigned a Z21 code, even if at a particular encounter, no infection or HIV-related condition is present. The codes for HIV status include the term Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, which is AIDS, and the AIDS Replaced Complex, which is ARC. When using the B20 code for symptomatic HIV status, make sure you also code all manifestations of the disease. When a patient is treated for an illness that is related to HIV, such as pneumonia, B20 is reported as the first listed diagnosis, followed by the conditions treated, which in my example would be pneumonia. If the patient is treated for a condition that's not related to HIV, such as a broken arm after falling down the stairs, the unrelated condition, which is the broken arm, is listed first, followed by B20, and then any HIV-related conditions if present and treated, as illustrated in the second example on this slide. Code R75, which is inconclusive laboratory evidence of HIV, is used for babies when the mother is HIV positive, but the baby's HIV status has not been confirmed. Code Z11.4 is special screening for HIV. This is used when the patient is being tested to determine whether or not they have HIV. If the patient has signs and symptoms of HIV, you would want to code those as well. If the patient comes back for the test results and is counseled on the results, 
whether they are HIV positive or negative, Z71.7 would be used for HIV counseling. Now I'd like you to try an HIV coding example for ICD-10. We have a 25-year-old patient who had unprotected sex with a stranger. The patient went to her PCP for an HIV test. The patient returned the following week for the results of the HIV test, which were negative. The nurse practitioner met with the patient to discuss safe sex practices at the second visit. What would the coding be for the visit for the HIV test? How about the follow-up visit? Please pause the webinar to complete this example and then hit play to continue and learn the answer. So let's go over this example. For the visit to the PCP for the test, the code is Z11.4, encounter for screening for HIV. For the second visit to receive results, the code is Z71.7, HIV counseling. We wouldn't be giving the patient codes for being HIV positive, however it is still appropriate to code for HIV counseling even though the patient doesn't have the disease. It's still import important for the patient to be counseled on how to prevent contracting HIV. For patients who are pregnant or recently had a baby and are HIV positive, you'll need at least two codes for the encounter, as the ICD-10 guidelines state that during pregnancy, childbirth, or the puerperium, a patient admitted or presenting for a health-related encounter because of an HIV-related illness should receive a principal diagnosis code from subcategory 098.7, which is HIV complicating pregnancy, childbirth, and the puerperium, followed by B20 for the HIV-related illness. In ICD-10, codes from the obstetrics chapter, which is chapter 15, are always coded before all other ICD-10 codes. If the patient has asymptomatic HIV status, you would use a code from subcategory 098.7 and Z21 for asymptomatic HIV status. Moving on to septicemia, SIRS, and sepsis. Sepsis refers to an infection due to any organism that triggers a systemic inflammatory response, which is SIRS. Therefore, all codes with sepsis in the title include the concept of SIRS. If the patient's sepsis does not result in any type of organ dysfunction, you're going to use a single code indicating the type of sepsis, such as A40.1, which is sepsis due to group B strep. If you remember from ICD-9, capturing this same scenario would have required two codes, one for sepsis and another for strep infection. Another change from ICD-9 to ICD-10 is that urosepsis no longer has a code associated with it in the alphabetic index. The provider must therefore be queried to determine a more specific diagnosis. If the patient has severe sepsis, either with or without septic shock, a minimum of two codes are required. Your first code is for the underlying systemic infection, such as A40.1, sepsis due to group B strep, which we had in a previous slide, followed by a code from subcategory R65.2, which is for severe sepsis. Your choices are severe sepsis, sepsis either with or without septic shock. If there is no documentation of the organism that caused the sepsis, A41.9 would be used in addition to the R65.2 code for unspecified sepsis. If the patient also has acute organ dysfunction, you would code for that as well. Now let's try a severe sepsis example. A 78-year-old male is treated in the hospital for symptoms of nausea, persistent fever, hyperventilation, and prostration. After a comprehensive history and exam, the physician determines the patient has streptococcal septicemia with severe SIRS which is ca causing the patient to go into acute renal failure. What are the codes for this patient? Please pause the webinar to complete this example and then hit play to continue and learn the answer. So let's go over this example. Our first code is A40.9, 
streptococcal sepsis unspecified. To find this code, I started by looking up septicemia in the alphabetic index of my ICD-10 book and saw the note indented under septicemia, meaning sepsis, C sepsis. I therefore went to sepsis and then looked for streptococcal indented underneath. Since we don't know what specific kind of streptococcal infection the patient has, I had to choose A40.9. I then confirmed this code in the tabular index. Our next code is R65.20, severe sepsis without septic shock. As documentation stated, severe SIRS, I went back to sepsis in the alphabetic index as we know from the previous slide that the term SIRS indicates sepsis. Under sepsis, I looked for the term severe and since septic shock was not documented, the correct code is R65.20. I then confirmed this code in the tabular index. Though we have our two codes to indicate the type of sepsis and that it is severe, we're not done yet because documentation states that the patient has acute renal failure as a result of the sepsis. Therefore, I went to the alphabetic index and looked up failure, and then indented under failure, I looked for renal. And once I found renal, I then looked for acute indented underneath, which codes to N17.9. I then confirmed this code in the tabular index. The order of the three codes is important, as the guidelines state that for severe sepsis, the first code is the code for the underlying infection, followed by the code for severe sepsis, and then any associated organ dysfunction. Also to help you out, when you confirm severe sepsis in the tabular, there is a note under subcategory R65.2, which states code first any underlying infection. This is followed by another note, which states use additional code to identify specific acute organ dysfunction. This is why it is so important to confirm your codes from the alphabetic index in the tabular. Next, I want to talk about nosocomial or hospital acquired infections. Remember how ICD-10 will be important in tracking public health concerns? This is something very important to entities like CMS or the CDC. If documentation states that a patient contracted an infection while in the hospital, Y95 should be used in addition to the code for the infection itself. Believe it or not, the entire code is Y95 and indicates to the payer that the infection code used was acquired in the hospital. There are some late effect or sequela codes in this chapter. Remember that a sequela is the condition produced after the acute phase of an illness or injury is over. There is no time limit for these codes and they are applicable in this chapter to conditions such as polio or tuberculosis. In this chapter, two codes will be required to indicate a sequela. Our first code will be the specific type of late effect, followed by a code indicating that the late effect is a result of a specific condition. This will hopefully make more sense on the next slide when we do an example. Here's our sequela example. A 60-year-old woman had TB six months ago. However, the patient has persistent cough and excessive excretion of mucus. After a chest x-ray, the physician makes a diagnosis of bronchiectasis with acute exacerbation, a late effect of pulmonary tuberculosis. What are the codes for this patient? Please pause the webinar to complete this example and then hit play to continue and learn the answer. Let's go over this example. Remember that for sequela coding, two codes are required in this chapter. We first code the current condition the patient has, which in this case is the bronchiectasis with acute exacerbation. To find the code, I went to the alphabetic index and found bronchiectasis. Indented under this main term is the word with, and below this I looked for the term exacerbation which has the word acute next to it in parentheses. And this gives us a code of J47.1, which I then confirmed in the tabular. Our next code is our sequela code, indicating that the bronchiectasis is a late effect of another condition. As the documentation stated, 
that the bronchiectasis is a late effect of pulmonary tuberculosis, I went to sequela in the alphabetic index. You are probably wondering why we are not looking up pulmonary tuberculosis in the alphabetic index and adding a seventh character of S for sequela like we discussed in the introduction to ICD-10 webinar. However, the seventh characters indicating episodes of care are only used for pathologic fractures, injuries, and external causes of injuries. Not this chapter. Since the pulmonary tuberculosis is not one of these conditions, we need to go to sequela in the alphabetic index to find our code. Under sequela, you want to find tuberculosis, and then indented underneath, you'll find pulmonary, which is B90.9, which you then confirm in the tabular. Now it's time for our quiz. Our first question is, what code is assigned for symptomatic HIV patients? Our second question, what code category is assigned to identify an infection with drug-resistant microorganisms? Our final question is, what code is assigned for severe sepsis with septic shock? You can pause the webinar to write down your answers and then hit play to find out if you were correct. Now let's go over the examples. The answer to our first question is B20. You can find this code by going to HIV in the alphabetic index. The answer to the second question is category Z16, which can be found by going to the term resistance in the alphabetic index, and then indented underneath is the word organism, then the word two, then drug. You would then look for the specific drug the organism is resistant to. Remember, it is important to code that for public health purposes. Our third answer is R65.21. You can find this code by going to sepsis in the alphabetic index and then looking for the term severe. Under severe, indented below is the verbiage with septic shock, which codes to R65.21. Remember, you would first code the sepsis infection first followed by R65.21 and then any associated organ dysfunction. And of course, with all questions, we always confirmed our answers in the tabular index. Remember, the United States will be using ICD-10 on October 1st of 2015. After the October 1st compliance date, it will be very important to verify that claims are being received and to check remits for denials based on the ICD-10 conversion. This concludes Chapter 1 of ICD-10-CM, Infectious and Parasitic Diseases. Please feel free to check out our webinars on all 21 chapters of ICD-10-CM. If you need further assistance with ICD-10 training for physicians and or staff, please visit the Vantage Point website at www.vantagepointconsult.com or call us at 203-288-6860. Thank you.